go ahead and call to order the Thursday, May 9th, 2019 meeting of the Royal o Zoning Board of Appeals. The board does not write the zoning ordinance, but does have the authority to grant relief from it where practical difficulty or unnecessary hardship would result. The board will vote on each agenda item following a public hearing. Use variance requests require a minimum of six affirmative votes in order to grant the requested variances. Non-use variance requests require a minimum of five affirmative votes in order to grant the variances. If you would like to request that the table or that the board table or a junior case due to the absence of a full board, please inform the chairperson immediately following the public hearing. We do have, we're down two people this evening, so we only have seven out of nine board members. Petitioners shall do their best to limit their presentations to 10 minutes. Each participant in a public hearing shall do their best to limit their comments to three minutes, which brings us along to our first agenda item, which is item B, approval of the minutes for the April 11th, 2019 meeting. Motion approved. We have a motion by Mr. Kroll. I'll support. Second by Ms. Zukin. Any questions, corrections, deletions? All right. That being not seeing any, I will call for the vote. All those in favor signify, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That moves us on to older unfinished business. None, <coughs> but I would like to take yes, just sir. a moment to uh, introduce a new staff member who's here today with us, Julie from our office. Uh, everyone, welcome, Julie, and, and maybe you could give us just a brief overview of your prior history and being here. Sure. Hi, everyone on the board as well as sitting in the audience today. I am a new a planner, too, with the City of Royal Oak. I've been here about two months now. Um, first Zoning Board of Appeals meeting that I'm sitting in on here. I previously was a planner for the city of Grand Rapids for about a year. So um, that was a really exciting um, opportunity to work in a place that's doing a lot of, um, you know, cutting edge zoning work. But I'm excited to um, be back here closer to home. I grew up in Oak Park, Berkeley, so it's nice to um, be back close to family and back in the region that got me interested in planning for the first place, which is Metro Detroit. So I am very happy to be part of the team, and I will be helping with um, a variety of things going forward, but Zoning Board of Appeals is definitely one of them. So happy to be here, uh, non-voting, obviously, but... Well, welcome. welcome. Thank you very much. All right, so let's move right along to our first item of new business, which is item number D1, case number 190512, public hearing on the appeal of Zen Mode LLC petitioner and Avenue 11 LLC owner for the following variances. Mr. Murphy. This property is located on 11 Mile Road. It's directly across from the farmer's market. Some of, it, uh, some of you may, may be familiar to it, familiar to you, uh, the photograph on the screen in front of you illustrates it as the, that brown block building. On this particular property, there are three, three buildings. This commercial block building, as well as adjacent to it, an older, an older home that has eight residential units within it. And then to the rear, there are, there's another separate building which has two residential units. The property is zoned multiple family residential, which does not allow for commercial activities. Uh, so it does allow for the multiple family residential, which is on site, but not the, not commercial. And this vacant building was previously occupied by a psychologist's office. And the building's been vacant for quite some time. It's been vacant for over a year. Under zoning ordinance provisions, non-conforming uses that vacate the premise for more than a year lose the non-conforming <coughs> status. Uh, if it was six months or eight months, uh, any of those variations less than a year where another professional office wanted to move into this location, it would arguably be a permitted use, something that we would administratively review and approve. However, the particular, it's been more than a year, so any use that's established in this particular tenant space, this building, needs to conform to uh, the zoning ordinance provisions for the multiple family residential zoning district. And a, the petitioner is proposing to establish a, a personal service spa with massage services, and that is neither a permitted nor special land use in the multiple family residential zoning district. 
their business plan does denote uh, the following personal services, waxing, facial and skin treatments, detoxification, and massage services. And uh, as the board knows, the city's zoning ordinance does define massage establishments as an adult-oriented business. So the petitioner is seeking a use variance in order to establish a personal service spa with massage. Again, if it was another office, a uh, retailer, carry-out restaurant, all of those would require a use variance. Is, uh, Joe, is the entire block zoned, I mean, the Superior Fish, is that building zoned that way as well? No, it's not. No, so that, it stops there different. and then the, the next building over is? That has multiple family residential designation. Really? The apartment building, yes. Is that normal? <clears throat> uh, it's not uncommon that there are various zoning designations on a block. That, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, Adult-oriented businesses are a special land use in the general business zoning district, and that's going to be most of the properties along Woodward Avenue. <laughs> We do apply that same criteria for such a regulated use to this particular site um, or this particular particular use, it, whether it be in, in the I know, zoning district where it's a special land use or in this case where it needs a use variance. And it has specific distance requirements from oh, more sensitive uses. It does require uh, to be a 1,000 feet from a school, library, park, playground, daycare, or religious institution and it also requires at least 150 feet, 150 foot distance from adjacent residential. This particular property is, is unable to meet both of those provisions and I'll, I'll simply summarize by saying that we did a calculation of various adjacent uh, uses that were referenced and the fact that it's uh, due to its location, it just it can't comply with those setbacks. So they're seeking a variance from all of those requirements. There are there is a surface parking lot on the site, and it currently is deficient in the number of parking spaces that are required for <coughs> all of the uses on the site. There are a total of 10 residential units. We require two parking spaces per unit, so the residential component requires 20, and the office component requires 14 spaces. Uh, the previous use as a psychologist's office requires the same amount of parking that the proposed personal service establishment uh, re requires. So it's, it's, a, it's a similar number. There's no increase in the deficiency of parking. <coughs> Therefore, there's no need for it, it to have a parking waiver from because it's not increasing the deficiency. Uh, however, there is a, and I'll refer to the aerial photograph and the site plan. And the, and the photographs. You'll see along the west side of the property <coughs> between the former Superior Fish Building and this particular <coughs> structure, there's a drive aisle that's 13 and a half feet wide. And there is a drive aisle on the east side of the property, uh, rather the east side of this subject property, but it's, it's located on the property uh, of the adjacent apartment complex. I'll scroll over to the site plan and point that out. The drive aisle that we, I referenced, the one-way drive aisle is here, and the adjacent drive aisle, which is said from the uh, passerby, you wouldn't know there's a property line that's, that differentiates those two. Those, based on our research, those two properties, this subject property and the adjacent Blackburn apartments appear to have been owned by one property owner at some many years ago and that looked as though they had anticipated to do a development uh, that incorporated both in a similar apartment style to the existing Blackburn apartments they did the, the one half east half they didn't do the west half for some reason and they were able to split it <coughs> without uh, any recorded easement agreement <coughs> excuse me to allow for the parking on this particular site to be able to egress to the property to the east. Therefore, uh, as we've unfortunately seen in some examples recently in front of the ZBA, where there's a, what was thought to be a commonly shared driveway without an easement agreement, where property owners at some point don't get along or what have you, have different ideas, 
and that drive aisle is no longer there, and that this site would be landlocked with uh, essentially a, just a one-way drive aisle. And so there's a variance request on the there's a variance request today to recognize essentially that one-way drive aisle as this property's sole access. So in the future, if there's any differentiation um, that eliminates that drive aisle, whether it be a dispute, a barrier, a new building, that that there was a motion taken to recognize this particular site as having just a one-way drive aisle. So, Joe? So you're saying, because when, when I was involved in it, one person <coughs> owned all these buildings, and it wasn't that long ago, maybe four years ago, or something, or four or five, I would guess. It's now been split up? To the best of my knowledge, it's been divided for quite some time. Well, not, I mean. I have to check county records, but. Yeah, I mean, when I was working there, it was one person that owned, uh, owned all the. All the buildings. They own the buildings in back, you know, and the buildings on the side and that building. And it, yes, and the apartments to the east are owned by a different property owner. They are okay. They were owned by the same person <coughs> when I was involved in it. Okay. Because that made a lot. I mean, there was miles of parking because you had you had kind of those people leaving. I mean, it was there was really yes a lot of parking visually. It all lends itself to being yeah. one property. But as we've seen, uh, there was another case on East Eleven Mile Road that you may recall last winter mm -hmm. uh, and the board was asked to step in to to provide essentially some resolution to that dispute and and an action to approve this or recognize this as a as their sole one-way driveway would uh, I think alleviate some of that issue in the future I mean I know you don't have a record of it I mean but if you just had to ballpark it had to be at least X amount of years I mean we're talking at least 25 30 years ago for there be, yeah. to be for there to be no recorded record exactly Probably 40 50 we were looking right, at right. Things. Now we found records from I think it was just after World War II that, that recognized this particular building converting to a bakery okay and then it was a radio station offices for a radio station and then it was a psychologist's office and now this proposal Right. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? Yes, ma'am. Um, is it correct that if the use variance were granted, B and C would not be required if massage services weren't offered, if it was just the waxing and facials? Yes, and that's correct. That's correct. Any other questions? All right, not seeing any. Are the petitioners present? Please, come forward. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Um, as he mentioned, um, the business will be a day spot, which will bring diversity and business to the area, as you all know. Um, oh, the Miss, could I have you introduce yourself for the record, please? I apologize. That's yes, okay. Asia Del McCree, owner of Zimmo LLC. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so as you all know, the area is flooded with bars and entertainment, um, food, different things like that. There's no spa within the area. Um, so like I said, bringing that diversity in business. We are very excited about the new parking structure being built on 11 miles. So that'll kind of combat our parking issues. And I actually parked over there today and walked here just to see around this time and during business hours what parking will look like. And it has about 10 free spaces at this current time. So just a little bit more about the business. As Mr. Murphy mentioned, um, it will be a day spa, but it'll be a little bit outside of your typical day spot, bringing a more holistic pro approach to things. So two of the main um, things that will bring money to the business is the Him Himalayan salt room. And if it, any of you are familiar with that, um, that basically just removes toxins from the body, um, from different areas of the body. And it helps with respiratory issues such as asthma, bronchitis. Um, the Ionic foot detoxing also remove toxins for the body from the liver and such areas as the kidney. Um, so as he mentioned, there will be waxing services, facial and screen, scan treatments, massages, like I mentioned, the ionic foot detoxing, as well as the Himalayan salt room. Um, just some more, more details about the, sorry, it keeps going in and out. Um, just more information about the industry in general. Um, the business has, I'm sorry, the beauty industry, in which spas fall under, has grown over the years up until 2018, actually at a rate of 3.1% to growing to 15.4 million, um, excuse me, billion. Um, so over the past five years, uh, that rise has risen to 8.9% as well. Okay. 
And I did want to mention that all employees will, of course, be licensed. So everyone performing massage services and skin treatments, things of that nature um, as well. So I don't have too much more to add. Mr. Murphy did such a great job in explaining the business. And I do want to just mention that nothing will change as far as um, it won't be a burden to the city, I would say, because we're not changing anything with inside of the building. Nothing will be put on the city um, as far as the space itself. We're just looking to get the use variants approved to be able to provide services that are not currently in the area. Are there any questions for the petitioner? Mr. Olfak? Do you have, are you currently operating the service somewhere and you're relocating or is this, it, it looks like it was brand new. It is. We've okay. run into some different issues such as this with getting spaces and opening. Okay. Uh, have you had experiences in, in, in this before and if so, where? <coughs> yes. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't give that background on myself. So I currently work um, and implement satellite health clinics. So I have a a lot of background in opening up, starting new and fresh and opening up a full clinic and getting it up and running. Um, so I currently work and have been for the past three years at Planned Parenthood of Michigan, opening up and managing the satellite clinics. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if you know the answer to this or if the property owner would be the better one, but I don't know if they're here tonight. Right. Has anyone tried reaching out to the, uh, to the uh, apartment owners next door to they see? They own the... The, that building the, the, well. the same own, the property owners that you're going to be renting from also yes. own that apartment? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, was, I, I guess my question ultimately was going to be, has anyone talked about recording an easement in terms of, you know, egress for vehicles across that, that parking lot there? Right. Because uh, that, that would go towards addressing one of the concerns Absolutely. that is a use variance request or a, a dimensional variance request tonight. Absolutely. Um, no, that has not been explored at this time. Uh, I don't know if anyone previously has, but for this particular business, it has not. But thank you for bringing it up. I will definitely bring that to their attention. The um, Really, the, the, the drive on the west side of the building <coughs> is probably good for bicycles, but I don't know anybody would take a car through there. It's tight. It's tight. It's tight. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Slide would go through it. <laughs> But people can just come in and out of the same space. There's a lot of businesses that you would do that at. So I don't think that part of it would be as much an issue, but I agree that that space is tight. Any other questions for the petitioner at this point? All right, not seeing any, I'm going to ask you to take a seat, ma'am, so I can go ahead and open Thank up you the. All. Yeah. No, after the parking. Yeah. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to address the ZBA on this issue? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, please come forward. You have three minutes. Give me your uh, name and address, if you would, please, for the record. Uh, my name is Dave Niffin. We live at 206 North Troy Street, uh, Royal Oak, Michigan. Um, I Obviously, the closest residential house to this, um, this development or property, we are, uh, the Superior <coughs> Fish Lot backs up to our side yard. So that's the proximity. If I was to measure directly our house to this building, say, 90 foot. So we're within the parameters, so the parameters fit my house, our property, to a T. Um, I'd have a few concerns. One, I'm not that familiar with, with the zoning policies here. By opening this, this up and granting them a variance, would that open the door that if they're decided in two years to say, well, we're an adult business, we want to be a different adult business, and we've already passed these qualifications, uh, we have already have a use variance, does that allow it to be a strip club in the future? Um, I, I mean, that's a concern. I mean, I have a small child, and uh, you know, 90 foot away, I, I really don't want that to happen. Um, I don't know if zoning, if that's how it works. Once you've opened that door, is it Pandora's box? Further, once you open that door for the distance requirements from the church, from the school, from a residential house, was that open the door for them to then get a liquor license, saying we've already established this business, we're, we're this close, um, can we waive that as well? Because we wouldn't want that either. We, um, we're directly across the street from Imagine, and it, uh, the back door of Imagine is turned into like a, a hangout for employees, and they hang out there all day, they drop off, they drop off in our driveway, and it's, it's, it's a burden. And of course, I'm not putting that burden on this new business, but another liquor establishment would certainly be troublesome. Um, the other thing would be is if they don't have enough parking, one, where are they gonna go? They're gonna troll down Troy Street. Maybe they're gonna park on Farnham. Maybe they're gonna pull into the Superior Lot if they don't chain it that night. Um, <coughs> or is there gonna be a lot of backups, people trying to get in and out that driveway to where we're sitting, waiting to turn down Troy Street? So that would be a concern too. Um, 
Like I said, I don't know that much about this specific business, but um, what bothers me is what, what it might open the door to down the road. You know, what if, it, what if this business doesn't work out in a year because it's, a, it's an odd location and there's a lot of construction right there? I mean, we don't know what's going to be going on in the, the whole new city center for a whole year. Essentially, it's going to be a construction zone. So, you know, maybe if this business fails, then what? So that would be my concern as the closest residential house to it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to address the ZBA on this matter? All right, then I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing, bring it back to this side of the table. Ma'am, if you want to come back forward, and then Mr. Murphy, I think I'm going to sort of punt that question to you in terms of if this is granted, <coughs> what types of uses could it potentially lead to in the future? I think it's a reasonable question. Certainly. The petitioner has provided a specific business plan and a related correlated floor plan that is very specific to personal services, which in, happen to include massage. If the board did grant a use variance for this uh, adult use element of their business, it would be the the approval would be specific to your floor plan and your business plan. Absolutely. Would have no correlation or wouldn't carry over to any other type of adult establishment whatsoever. Just want to get that on the record. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chair, I think we have to reiterate that. I will. Okay. <laughs> Thank I just you. wanted to get that question answered. Mm -hmm. All right, so, Mr. Clyde. Oh, I said one, one question for the applicant. Uh, can you explain your operations based on, I guess, is this appointment based? How many people do you foresee in this at any one time? <coughs> to address the question about parking, the number of people that could access the space at right. any given time. Right, absolutely. Um, so, it will be scheduled in a certain way to where there weren't too many individuals in the facility at one time. So I'm not thinking that it will be 10 people on schedule, especially depending on what services they are there for. We may have walk-ins as far as the detoxing um, and even the salt room, but we will have a specific schedule set up where there are blocks that uh, people can make an appointment and it will be appointment-based, correct? Um, except for, like I mentioned, those two those two things will be walk-in based. So you can come and get a de uh, foot detox at any time, as well as uh, the use of the salt room. Thank you. At this point, ma'am, I just want to give you the reminder, we have seven out of nine board members. You need to carry six affirmative votes in order for this to be granted. If you would like us to table this until next month, until we have a fuller board, I know we'll have one new member who's sitting in the audience right now who should hopefully be here. and. You know, it's it's completely up to you. If you feel more comfortable waiting for a month, we can do that. If you want us to proceed, it's 100% your choice. We can proceed. Okay. Thank you. All right, then I'll go ahead and bring it back. Yes, sir. I had one question uh, for Mr. Murphy. Uh, since there are multiple buildings on this property, if we approve this variance, this use variance for this building, will that then apply to other, those other buildings as well? I just nope. wasn't clear on how that worked. No, it would be limited to the petitioner's proposal. Okay. In this, this building, this tenant space. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Rolfack. Uh, no, I forget it. Oh. All right. <laughs> I have a question. Mr. Curtis. I, as I understand it, this use variance has everything to do with massage. It's being Don't classified that, as a adult-oriented business. Does that presume that children and teenagers don't ever get massages? That is not presumed. Okay. I, I just, sort of a rhetorical question, as you can see. <coughs> um, it interests me that this, you know, ordinance exists, but we've seen various cases come before us in the recent past because things like um, arcade games at a local restaurant bar, um, something called a gaming lounge, which does internet gaming, falls into the city's sort of understanding of arcade, um, right? And and uh, uh, now I'm not an expert in this next example. <laughs> Something about eyebrow blading we saw that had to do with uh, microblading. Thank you so much. Qualified as tattooing. Yeah, qualified as tattooing. And here we have a spa health services oriented business that's coming before us in no small part because of this idea of calling that a massage parlor. So I, can I ask the petitioner if they, if they would, would you distinguish 
the idea of a massage parlor in your business, is that two different things yes. in your mind? Absolutely. Could you speak to that for us for a second? Yes. So we are including massages because it is health. It is wellness. Um, a lot of people, mas massages, just to be quite frank, will bring a lot of revenue to the business. Um, but again, most of the services will be more... We're not going to be doing microblading. <laughs> um, most of the, but most of the services will be holistic and remain as such. So I guess I just wanted to bring up that conversation as we talk about this. Thank you. Yes, sir. I would like to make a motion to approve all variances. All four. We have a motion by Mr. Kroll. Thank you, Mr. Kroll. Is there a second? I'll support it. Thank you. Thank you. We have a second, Mr. Kroll. Um, I, like Mr. Curtis, are greatly bothered that massage and topless dancing all falls under the same range in Royal Oak. Um, I, I have massages once a week. I don't think I could probably walk without them. Um, I, I know this building. I renovated it a few years ago. Um, it doesn't have a parking problem. If, if, one per, if Mr. Johnson, whoever still owns all these buildings, there's miles of parking. Um, there's there's <coughs> ease of entrance, uh, especially if one owner owns both of them. Um, I I think it's a perfect use for this building, and I don't I don't know that there's a, a I thought the people that had it before was a good use for it. It's a it's a building kind of stuck in between. Um, it, it couldn't be a restaurant. It, it couldn't be a lot of things, but uh, it's not really a retail uh, application where it is. But, but I do think it works well there. So, so really the issue becomes, um, and, and I, I'm old enough to have been there when we had problems with massage parlors, um, but boy, that's a long time ago. You know, I, I think the, the whole world of massage in the last 20 years has changed dramatically, and it's, I'm not seeing a happy ending kind of situation here. Um, <laughs> Well, that, that's what caused this. I mean, there were syringes on the, there were syringes and, and other paraphernalia outside. It was terrible at a time. And we've just kind of like <clears throat> gone to the world of Oz and said, this is it forever. Well, I, I have a hard time accepting that. So I do support it. I think it's a great use for this building. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Are there any other comments? I'll, so can? I'll just throw in, um, the use variance is separate, by the way, from the use of it as a massage parlor. Because it's it is zoned as multifamily and and they are asking for it to be commercial, um, and I don't have a problem with that due to the fact that the property just to the east of it, or to the west of it, is a commercial property, um, and it's been commercial in the past even though it's lapsed, so I I wouldn't have a problem with that, and I don't have a problem with any of the services being offered, Thank so that's why I'm supporting it. Mr. Ofek. I think they have uh, quite a few hardships that they can't help. Uh, one, uh, the fact that this place has almost seemed like it's always been some kind of commercial use, and just because it's lapsed, they have to come back for a use variance of some form or another. They would have had to come for it for the adult services part, but still, it's a use variance. So that's a hardship that's not their own making. Uh, the two-way drive aisle with, um, yeah, 13 feet is tight, but even if it was one way, I'm sure people are courteous enough to do that if for whatever s s happens in the future, it, they cut it off. So they can't help that, and I have no problem with that. Um, and then it just comes down to the minimum distance required. I don't think there's anywhere in the city probably she could go and put this without running to something somewhere because of just all the churches, parks, everything and houses around so again if she wants her business here in Royal Oak that she's going to come before us for those no matter what so uh, I think her business seems very uh, holistically and health focused so I'm not worried about it being something else uh, especially with that location that would be silly with the new police station being right there just asking for anything <laughs> Absolutely. That's trouble. Um, so I, I'm not worried about the use. Uh, so in any case, I have no problem supporting this. Any other comments? Mr. Clapp. And just quickly, I, I'll be in support as well. I struggle to see the adverse impact this business would have on the neighborhood based on your business plan and what you told us this evening. So I'll be in support. Thank you so much. All right. Any other comments? Not seeing any, I will call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? 
Motion carries. You're all set. Good luck. When do you plan an opening? Um, as soon as possible now. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Unless you want to stay for the rest, you know, you're welcome to. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great night. All right, moving along to item number D2, which is case number 190503, public hearing on the appeal of Young and Young Architects Petitioner and Joshua Albert Owner for the following variances. We have 19.3 feet of the minimum required 35-foot south Rear yard setback located at 720 East Farm and Farnham Avenue. Mr. Murphy. This particular little vacant lot is located at the corner of Farnham and Potter, and the petitioner is proposing to build a two story single family home with an attached garage that's accessed from Potter. As a corner lot, we treat the narrower street frontage in determining the front yard set, the siting of the home, and in determining the, for where the front yard setback applies and where side yard and rear yard setbacks apply. Based on the orientation of this lot and the frontage, there's a required rear yard setback um, of 35 feet that's applied. <coughs> and I'll refer to the, the map in the, in the report. Perhaps I don't have a map in the report. We'll refer to the petitioner's drawings. Mm -hmm. Vacant corner lot. House along, there's a house along Potter <coughs> as well as along Farnham. And they're required to have a rear yard setback, again, along this portion of the lot. They're also required to have a setback along Potter equivalent to the adjacent home, which they do have. I'll refer to the next drawing, the floor plan, and explaining the, ne the necessity for a variance. Petitioner has shown, has illustrated on the floor plan, the location of the attached <coughs> garage, and the attached garage has living space above it. We measure the required 35 foot rear yard setback to the nearest point of living space. So we're measuring it to that upper level, the second floor of the structure. And that is denoted uh, here. The dashed area is the lower roof line which is the one-story portion of the home of the attached garage. And you'll see the petitioner has illustrated where the upper floor will be. Again, the ordinance requires that it be the 35-foot setback off of that rear lot line. The elevations are helpful as well. The petitioner did a, an excellent job of illustrating that on elevations, and we'll refer to those. We're measuring the side yard setback to the nearest point of living space, again, upper floor. And that living space is about 15.7 feet off of that rear setback. Again, it needs to be 35 feet, so they're seeking a waiver from that difference. I will note that if this was an attached a garage which did not have living space above it, it's possible for the petitioner to have that garage be even closer to that rear lot line. <coughs> under the ordinance provision so long as the roof line is um, the roof line of the of the attached garage has a is a has a lower and a differentiated roof that prevents someone from being able to walk continuously from the upper floor the second floor of the home to the space above the garage so typically they accomplish that with a lower roof line a different roof pitch something of that nature uh, be much lower roof line in this case they've elected to have a living space over a portion of the attached garage and they need the variance because it's within that rear yard setback. Any questions for Mr. Murphy? All right, not seeing any. Are the petitioners present? Please come forward. Good evening, members of the zoning board. My name is Roger Young with Young and Young Architects. I'm here with my client, Joshua Albert, and it's a privilege to be before you. Uh, Joseph, thank you for the, the great review. And um, I'll just tell you a little bit about us uh, as a firm and about my client, um, family business. My father's 92. He's still practicing. This is one of his designs. He's coming in every day. It's amazing. Um, we specialize in single-family homes that are site-specific and specifically tailored to our clients' needs. So this is a one-off house. This is designed specifically for <clears throat> Joshua's needs and his family's needs. Um, we're also very sensitive to the surrounding and the neighborhood materials application, building forms. Um, 
And so the architecture speaks to Joshua's leanings to be a more transitional type building. Um, and his spatial needs dictate the need for the living space above the garage, which is encroaching into the south or rear yard setback. Um, the building does comply with all other zoning requirements. It's actually much lower than the maximum height. We, we do our best architecture. Uh, I'll say Frank Lloyd Wright strongly influences our design, so we want to be low and of the earth. And so the, the roof lines are such that we clip the hip roof to not come to a peak, keep the building forms low, and specifically to the south side of the building, uh, we really worked to create a design that provided more open air and, and visual continuity between the neighbor's home to the south, um, which their north portion of their property is their driveway. <clears throat> um, Joshua's rear yard is is his garage, and then it's, it's, it's super confusing with the corner lot, but it is his side yard, so we have the two side yard conditions. Um, I'll speak to that in just a moment. Um, but so they are, thank you for pulling that up, Joseph. So yes, uh, we have a step roof line from the main portion of the house that comes down to the lowest point that we can create um, with a, a truss above the living space uh, over the garage, which is the master bath and master closet. The spaces of the home, um, I'll say are modestly sized. Um, that, that portion of the house is about 19 by 20. Um, gross is about 400 square feet or about 4% of the property. So we, we could take that space, and as, as Mr. Murphy explained, we could push the garage further south to three feet from the rear property line, drop that roof line down so that you couldn't walk without banging your head from the house and turn it into an attic. But that just seemed contrived, and, and we really want to, uh, to create architectural form that was less about massing and more about sensitivity to the surroundings and to the neighbor to the south in particular who would be most impacted by this um, visually. Um, uh, again, the house, it, it does comply with the square footage of the site, so it, it's in compliance. It's not a big foot per se. We try to keep the, the forms undulating so it's more dynamic building. Um, and the renderings, they help, but they really don't tell the story. It, it'll be much more uh, lovely than this, but it, it at least shows you some of the uh, things that are happening within the house. The the upper portion of the building, um, and Joseph, could you go to the to the elevation with the garage, just so I could show from a visual standpoint. Thank that one right there. Uh, one, yeah, that perfect. Um, the measurement of the 19, I'll just, I'll just round up to 20, to so the 20 feet from the upper portion of the wall that's closest to the south property line. If Joseph were to move his mouse cursor to the midpoint of the square window to the right, Joe, right, keep going, uh, not that guy, further over, a little bit more, right, a little bit, that's it. That portion from there to the south is the portion that is encroaching into the, the rear setback. Um, again, that, that ceiling height is, is, is just under eight feet. The overall height at that point from grade up to the point of the site is flat um, is about 23 feet. So it's, it's overall height is quite low in comparison with some of the newer builds. Um, and then it steps down to just over 11 feet at the flat roof portion. Um, um, the floor plan contemplates for, for Josh and his family kind of a, a aging place. This is his um, ho hopefully for many decades, his home. Um, he would like to have his parents and in-laws perhaps move in someday. So we've created accessibility in the elevator. We didn't want to put the living sleeping spaces in the lower level. So hence the spaces are all up on the upper floor. And that really is the, the need of the variance to keep the sleeping quarters on the upper floor. Um, even though the lower level will be finished and we provide the egress walls, more for, for safety, um, but we didn't want to put the sleeping rooms down below. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, we really feel that the, the need for the variance is, is, is valid due to the hardships of these 25-foot side yard setbacks, both the front being, and then the side. It, it takes a substantial building area away from the program um, and, and pushes the house further to the, to the west um, which we've tried to move the house further away from the home that exists right there as the former house was right at that side yard. I think it was only five feet from the side yard. So we tried to provide some relief between the homeowner to the, to the west um, and the existing new construction there. 
push it as far as away as possible from the neighbor to the south, even though we are asking for this additional living space on the upper floor that we, we designed intentionally not to be at grade. Um, other aspects of the site design, and we do comply with the open space <coughs> of, the, of the site. So um, in speaking with Joseph early on, he brought up a lot of things that we should be cognizant of, and we want to work with the planning department and, of course, zoning um, for a win-win for everyone. Any questions for the petitioner at this point? What's yeah. the total square footage of the living space? The total square footage is about 3,400 square feet. Last year, Mr. Olfak. Um, since you were coming before us for a variance on the uh, rear yard setback, I'm surprised you guys didn't try and get that fr that front yard side setback a little bit pushed from 25 down to like 20 uh, to relieve some of that back, but I understand I'm just trying to come for one variance. Um, the question I have more so is the office in linen, or the office on the second floor uh, with its file room, could that have been placed somewhere else so that you could have moved maybe like the master in that area, the, the bath over there in the closet so that you wouldn't have as much um, required setback on the upper floor? We actually did play with that, and, and part of Josh working at home is he wanted to be close to family, um, if the parents are home and their physical needs within earshot of that. We talked about, you know, it's your suggestion, putting that down in the lower level as an option. Um, it just seemed forced, frankly, and the plan, the upper floor plan, um, it just didn't, didn't have the flow. But we did, we did take that into consideration, absolutely. Any other questions? Mr. Glatt. Well, Anthony touched on some of my comments, too. I think it's a beautiful design. I know that corner lots always present a challenge, but that was my basic question, too. Is did you explore ways to reduce the variance request? Did you look at possibly shifting some of that massing or shifting some of those rooms maybe to the north over that den area on the first floor to help offset some of that? We, we, we did, and, and we were still trying to... I'm just, we're trying to eliminate as many boxes as possible on that upper floor and keep it open. Um, we, we went through several design iterations, and, and we're trying to just not push those primary functions into the basement. That, that, was, that was the goal. And we understood that we'd be before you asking for, for a variance of, of was quite substantial from a dimensional standpoint. We feel that the architecture, by, by keeping it low, by keeping it horizontal, by respecting and being sensitive to the open air requirements that we feel are necessary between buildings, that it was successful in the architecture and, um, and addresses the sensitivity that we should have to our neighbors. Um, part of the point was we also pulled the building further away from the building to the west as far as we could. We, we wanted to create more open space between those two buildings as well. So we're kind of solving two puzzles at the same time, trying to provide relief for the existing homeowner on both sides um, in this design. I know based on your work, I know it's well thought out. But one last question, too. Thank did you. you approach your neighbors, the surrounding neighbors? I know we did receive one negative comment from a, from we received an email today that Joe sent to us from one of the neighbors, not the immediate neighbor, but someone in the area about the design. No, we, I asked the, the general contractor, um, which, which would be Hudson Building and Alexander Homes, um, if they, in the prior design, because um, there was a design for, for Mr. Alpert, or for the property prior to Mr. Alpert purchasing the property. Um, and he said that he had never spoke to anyone um, and didn't, didn't have, but no, he did not. Okay. And I know that's always a good thing. We just didn't have any contacts. And um, I'm um, disappointed here that somebody did speak out against it. Um, were they in, are, are they in the direct vicinity or is it just the general? They Across are, the street. it's on Farnham, I believe. I forgot the address. On Farnham at the intersection uh, to the Alexander. east. Which yes. Alexander. Oh, it's uh, to the east. Talking about 6,000 style, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I know there's a newer build on that corner. 601. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Cole. One of the points that your neighbor made, which is kind of a good one, is that you have a blank piece of paper here, and, and we have rules. Um, I don't know that you've really presented a hardship that I can buy into yet. Um, and, and by the way, I, I'm a great admirer of your architectural services, um, and I think this is a beautiful home. I don't know that it's the right house for the lot. 
And when you have a blank piece of paper and you can design anything you want, you can certainly take our rules into consideration <coughs> and not come before us. Absolutely. So that was kind of the gist of what your neighbor was saying. Mm -hmm. um, you're asking for a lot. And it is a beautiful home, and I understand everything you're trying to do. Um, I always have an issue when all the elevations are way off. I, I think if you look at some things they've done in Birmingham where they didn't pay much attention to that for a while, um, a lot of things are jigging in and out, and it almost gets claustrophobic. So I, I can appreciate the neighbor's concern, and I would have the same concern if I lived there. Sure. I think you're sticking out considerably further than you have to with a blank piece of paper. No. Well, and to your point, we, well, in the rear setback, if the garage was attached without the living space above and we still had, let's just say, a 20-foot roof height, we could be as close as three feet from the rear lot line. So we were trying to, to address that responsibility to the neighbor to the south to move the building as far away as possible, still provide the multi-vehicle garage, still keep the building down low. Um, we understand the zoning <coughs> requirements to not have living space above garages because usually what happens is the living space goes right to the edge of the building. And so there's no offset. So we, we felt that, that due to the hardships of the corner lot, frankly, there, there's an inherent hardship. And I'm obviously not the first person that's been before the board with residents and commercial building owners with corner lots. It's, they're tricky. Um, and trying to solve the spatial needs um, and functional needs of the client um, is why we're here before you. We think that it's a reasonable ask. We think that we've sh struggled and, and achieved um, a, a building that makes sense. I mean, I think it's, we're, it's not too big for the property. It's within the size requirements of the zoning that the, the architecture is, is respectful um, and, and that the alternative, and not that we're going to go there, would be to slam this building to the rear lot line. So we also wanted to be sensitive to that neighbor to the south and the neighbor to the west, frankly, and create more open space between the buildings. Um, Mr. Clay. Uh, just a question for Mr. Murphy. Uh, if this was a detached structure three feet from the lot line, what is the maximum height for that structure? And I guess we can compare that to what this is. How you mentioned the roof lines cropped a bit. What would that maximum height be for a detached structure with a tall peaked roof? At three feet from the lot line, it would need to be no taller than 13 feet at its highest midpoint. At the ridge. Midpoint. Oh, midpoint. 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 Yes, midpoint. the midpoint. If it had multiple peak, uh, multiple roof lines, we would take it to the highest midpoint. So if it, if it had dormers, we would take it to the midpoint of the dormer roof line. If it was a, uh, a singular roof line, we would take it to the midpoint from the east to the peak. So thir 13 feet to the mid, so the ridge will be higher than that. I mean, we don't have a design in front of us to compare it to, but it will be taller. It'd probably be close to 19 or 20. 19, 20 feet, that sounds about right. And what are we looking at here? We're at 23. 23 feet. That's to the midpoint of your... No, that's to the top. To the very top. It, uh, with the mansard, we'd, we'd, as Joseph said, <coughs> we'd, we'd be uh, 20 to the midpoint. I was trying to draw a comparison between the massing of that detached structure close to the lot line versus this structure, which is pushed back a bit with the second floor offset in that height. No, I'm glad you brought that to the board's attention. And we, we struggle with that. And I know you as an architect, it's, it's important. Um, and, and that's why we feel that some relief, and we know the number says a lot. It's a, a big number, but it, it just makes sense. It, architecturally, it makes sense. Um, the alternative to a building that was drawn and could be placed anywhere USA could be a disaster. Any other questions from the petitioner at this point? All right, I'm going to ask you to take a seat, sir, so I can open up the public hearing. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to address the ZBA on this matter? I think the other guy wanted to speak. Uh, Chuck McKittrick, uh, I live at 519 Potter Avenue. I just want to say, happy to see that the property is getting some activity on it. I think it's been sitting for a couple of years. Um, I also want to point, you know, say that, you know, I want to be welcoming and be a good neighbor. And I think I've shown that by uh, allowing for an easement to, uh, to allow uh, DTE to bury uh, power lines along my uh, fence line. Um, I also, uh, you know, paid some lawyer fees out of my pocket for this easement contract sign-off. 
Um, this meeting here is for uh, this this uh, standard setback code and get a, a, a variant off of that. I had some questions about, you know, technically why would we have to do that? I think some of those questions have been answered on seeing what the plans are. Um, I, I thought maybe there'd be an issue for service lines or, you know, foundation. And it sounds like it's, it's more <coughs> about builder or home preference. Um, Given that, what I what I want to understand is, you know, what are, what are the risks to the neighborhood? Mostly, what are the risks to me, um, you know, to deviate from this uh, setback standard? And, and the risks that I that come to my mind, um, you know, would be the privacy. Probably the number one would be the drainage capacity. I know uh, I have a dry basement, but I know some of my uh, neighbors on the street are not so fortunate. So I I want to just make sure if that. Setback standard is is uh, established to prevent you know drainage issues. Um, I guess neighborhood harmony um, and any construction disturbances. Um, I, I don't want to deny anyone the pursuit of their ideal home or environment. Um, I just want to kind of make sure I'm not subject to a situation that would make me unhappy. Um, so I'm just hoping that uh, as far as the the setback that. That we can come to you know some sort of a win-win uh, solution situation here. Um, those are my comments. I mean, any feedback to my I comments? I think Mr. Olfek might have a question for you. You said you're five one nine, the house. Yeah, right yeah, now. something to the south. Yeah. So if they had a detached garage and the garage was three feet off the lot line, would you have preferred that versus what they're prefer giving you, which is more like eleven feet off the lot line? I prefer more space. I would prefer the eleven feet. Yes. Okay. All right, any other questions for, uh, for this gentleman? All right, thank you very much, sir. Anybody else? Who's the owner? No, go ahead. Please, please. I'd like to hear from you. Okay. Hi there. Uh, I'm Josh Albert, and I am the person who purchased this property. I am a Royal Oak resident. I've been living in Royal Oak since 2002, and I absolutely love Royal Oak. I can't think of a better city in the whole world that I'd rather live in than Royal Oak. I live right over near Holiday Market. Uh, I live in those condos right over there. The condos are great, um, but it's I need more space. I've, I've, I've been saving up my, my, I've been working for all these years, living in the condo, and I've gotten to the point where I was looking at houses and I finally decided I, I, I want to build something. Um, part, of the, part of the reason I caused this variance, I, I have uh, a father who is, I already know I'm going to have to take care of him eventually. He has horrible echolasia with the esophagus. He has basically involuntary bulimia. Um, my mother's not going to be able to do this forever. She also suffers from a terrible hip problem, bursitis or whatever it's called. And I already know I'm going to have to deal with it. My sister has two infant children. She won't be able to deal with this, and I really don't want to wind up sticking them into a, any sort of a, a facility that requires you know, them to live in, in conditions that they otherwise wouldn't want to live in. So I wanted to build a house where I could have my parents live there with me because I know they're not going to be able to take care of their home much longer as well. And I wanted to get everything <coughs> else. I do work out of my home. I am a financial advisor. Uh, I've been doing that for 18 years now. So I do work out of my home. And I really I, I wanted this house designed for everything that I foresaw. Everything, you know, I, you spend all this time living in a, an 1,100-square-foot condo. You start realizing your priorities, and you start realizing what you really want included and what you can live without and everything like that. And I wanted a house that was just designed exactly as the way I wanted it here. And, you know, when, when they told me about how it's going to build and everything like that, their design work is impeccable. They told me, you know, we're going to have to seek a variance. We're going to need 19 feet 3 inches or whatever it is from the... I don't know the, the technicalities behind all the variances or anything like that. That's all Roger's area. But what I understand is that um, in order to make this work with the plan, I understand what you're saying. We do have a, a white sheet of paper. And, you know, sure, we could box the house up a little bit more, and I understand that. I'd have to cut out either an office or a bedroom or shrink my bathroom or something of that nature. Uh, and I really don't want to do that. I, I'm, I'm planning on living in this house for decades. I mean, this is going to be my home. I, I love the neighborhood. I, I'm, I'm so happy that I was able to get this lot and this property. I've been, like I said, searching for homes for, for quite some time for land to build on. And so that's basically what I have to say. I, I really uh, would very much appreciate if, if we could get this to happen because this would be 
a tremendous thing for everybody involved. And, and I'm glad that, that my neighbor is uh, also good with the plan and would rather it be like it is now as opposed to the other thing that we could have done there or whatever. So that's what I have to say. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Clatt. Uh, Joseph, I, to address the, your neighbor's concern about drainage, I assume that would go through well, the Let's wait for a public comment then. Just save those oh. questions. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Ma'am, I'm assuming you're next. Hi, I'm Jan Tomikowski. I live in the property that's um, behind Chuck's to the south of the proposed house. Yeah, so hello, Josh. Yeah, I think we'll probably be neighbors. However, I'm, I'm afraid I, I, a little, I have more reservations than Chuck, who's immediately adjacent to the, to the property. And I think there's a larger question that I feel affects all of us. Um, in terms of the amount of building that's been going on outside of the existing footprints of the structures that are there. The house I live in, I've been in for 25 years. It was built in 1941, and it's, it's not large, and I'm on a double lot also. And I've thought to myself over time, should we build up more? Should we make the house that, you know, sort of like what Josh is talking about? And the thing that I struggle with within myself is feeling like we need to honor some of both the existing aesthetics and also the green needs of our community. So when we talk about runoff and we talk about building uh, lots of building, we are, I think, talking about less ground space that exists to absorb ground, uh, absorb water. Am I, am I right about that? You probably know more about that than I. Yeah, that would be so. So homes that are built up to the and beyond the existing footprints, I think, may well pose a problem. I think we're trying to stretch to accommodate it. But in general, it's, it is a large problem. And in terms of how we impact the other green of our communities, and I think we try to be very sensitive to that, we're still affecting that as well when we're building larger and larger structures. I appreciate the architect talking about how he's trying to be sensitive to the aesthetic of the neighborhood. And yet if- Ma'am, keep, uh, ma'am. Yes. Uh, address us. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm sorry. Every time you turn your head, nobody you can hear you. The hear microphone okay. helps. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no so worries. I said I'm, I appreciate that his his sensitivity in terms of his, some of the aesthetics that he's talking about, and yet the the size of the property and some of the um, frankly the rationale for the size of the property I want to bring to bring a um, uh, bring up a memory of mine. I was before the planning committee years ago probably more than 10 years ago, probably well before all of you. Property two houses south of me was also asking for variance to do more building for I, uh, virtually an identical reason. They put up basically a pole barn on their, <laughs> on their property and they were going to have an in-law apartment above. There's never been an in-law living in that property that I can see. And uh, I, again, I'm not suggesting that he's uh, th there's no veracity to his his proposed plan, but I've been there and been there, done that, and we have this giant again. I think outside of what we intended, probably when certainly when plans were first put into place. I realize, however, that we have to flex for the needs of people who want to have larger properties. But I'm not sure that in in this kind of variance with almost 20 feet requested in a certain direction. And again, with sensitivity that they've described to the one property, I appreciate that. But might there be a way where, again, it's closer to what the, foot, the former footprint of the house was without greater elevation? So you hear my concerns are both general and specific. All right. And to address your concerns directly, I mean, what we are dealing with here is a setback issue. Yeah. There are ways that he could redesign this specifically with a unattached garage where his overall footprint would be as big, and frankly, it could be probably be just a little bit bigger. If he had a house that went above and beyond the percentage lot coverage that he was allowed, that would be a different variance that he would have to ask for. He's not ask, asking for it because he has not exceeded that number. I see. Not building a big foot. So one other comment, you know, again, I think, I don't know if it's, does this group or where do, the, where do plans begin in terms of what's allowed for var variance in general away from what the, uh, basically what's existing? Because as somebody, as somebody, Mr. Kroll, I believe it was, was talking about the disproportionate structures that appear in certain communities, and, and I, I've seen them in ours as well. Uh, so, you know, I'm not quite sure what the overall planning guidelines are, frankly, for size, footprint, 
and correspondence to existing aesthetics. Mr. Kroll? I can tell you that everybody comes in front of us is trying to break one law or the other. So we are a board, we are an appeal board where people can come in front of us. Um, some of the things we wrestle with are, we know that he can cut this garage off, put it in the back. He's not, he's not building a Bigfoot. It's not too much house for the lot. And it is in a neighborhood of large homes, larger homes than what you find in, in most Royal Oak neighborhoods. Um, so it's a juggling act for us, mm -hmm. right? We can just tell you all, no, go away. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we try to be a little more sensitive than that. Sure. And as I, I think I was more against this in the beginning than I'm becoming because as other board members have stated that if you cut that garage off and put it in the back, it's totally allowed, pr probably allowed larger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I can tell you with certainty there's going to be a house built and Mr. Albert's going to build a house on that lot. Yes. What we're yes. trying all the time together is what, what is the best for the neighborhood, what's the mm -hmm. best for... Mm -hmm. and what's the best for the city overall. So. Right, right. Well, and it's such a mix of properties, though. You know, to your point, there are many large homes immediately <coughs> to the, um, what is that, northeast of that proposed, of the proposed structure, lots of larger homes, mm -hmm. and yet immediately adjacent are many smaller homes. So. Right, well, thank you for your comments, ma'am. Thank, you. thank you so much. Is there anybody else in the audience? All right, I will go ahead and close the public hearing, bring it back to this side of the table, and why don't you come back up to the uh, microphone, sir, in case we have any additional questions for you. I saw Mr. Olfak first, then I'll go to Mr. Klatt. Um, I'd like to propose uh, to accept the variances as requested. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Olfak? Um, I think there are some unique circumstances, and as an architect, I actually appreciate some of the resolution that they did. Um, this is a double lot that uh, we always keep on seeing lots being split so you can cram more house on smaller lots, which case was before us, I believe, two years ago with the problematic. Uh, 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 and here they're putting one house on one lot. So where you could actually be taking up more lot coverage, they're actually taking up less lot coverage of if you had two houses. Um, and even though, as I stated, if we separated out the garage, the garage could actually be closer on the neighbor actually said he appreciates that it's farther away. And as Mr. Klett brought out, the height of the, the house there is about the same height as it would have been with the detached garage. So proportionality, you're keeping similar proportions there and, and compacting the whole situation better. Like I said, if I would have had no problem if they would have came to us and shifted the house a little bit more in the front yard uh, to get give 519 even more space, but they didn't come before, so that's a moot point. Um, so I, I think this is just a unique circumstance being a corner lot, a double-sized corner lot in this case, and it, it is being very sympathetic to both its neighbors. And, and in the end, I think it'll, it'll be a nice build. It's not going to be one of those houses that overpowers like it could have, or two houses on this lot with one that definitely had a garage right there next to the neighbor. Um, maybe two garages for both those right next to the neighbor. So I, I think in the end, it, it may not, they may feel that this is not the best solution, but in the end, as an architect, I think this is actually one of the better solutions for this space. Those are great points. And one thing I mentioned before too, I believe that when they do Smith for building permit that any drainage concerns will be addressed at that point. So that'll be addressed by the building department. So the lot will comply, their drainage will comply and be, the water will be moved appropriately. Absolutely. That, that's, that goes without question. And we want to do everything as far as the sensitivity to the ecology. Not that this is a lead building, but it's just who we are philosophically. So we will be extremely responsible. And again, reach out to the neighbors prior to the build to let them know what steps might be occurring and things that we're doing to address their concerns. I think that my final point is open space when it comes to, I mean, you're well below the lot coverage and there actually is a lot of green space. It's just the setbacks force you to push the house towards one corner. <coughs> so unfortunately, that can't be in your rear yard. It's in your front and side, but it's, it's not overbuilt in my opinion. Thank so you. So I'll be in support or I already am in support. Mr. Kroll. Um, I was on the fence, but seeing both of our architects up here have supported this, uh, I'll be in support of it as well. Ms. Ukin. Um, I think the, the house, the design is architecturally beautiful. I really like it. 
But I was convinced by Mr. Kroll at the beginning. Um, this is a blank slate. Um, it could be designed differently. I don't think we should look at what they could have done as far as two houses or a garage further back. I don't think that's what they're going to do. I think they can comply with the ordinance. I don't think there's any hardship shown. I don't think the uh, restrictions unreasonably prevent them from using the property for a permitted purpose. I don't think the um, variance would do substantial justice to the adjacent property owners. And I don't think there's any unique circumstances. We have corners on every block. Um, and we have to deal with the ordinances. So I won't be supporting this. All right. Well, before I call for the vote, and I apologize, so I just drew a blank on it. Again, we are down two, two board members. He needs five out of seven votes. Is that correct? So I can, I'm not going to call for the vote until you say either proceed or we can hold it over till next month. It's entirely up to you, sir. Yeah, I, so I just need a yes or a no. Uh, yes, please proceed with the vote. All right, we'll do, okay. sir. All right, are there any other board members who have any comments on this plan? All right, not seeing any, I will call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. All right. Motion, Motion passes. You're all set. Wonderful. Thank you all for your, for your kind and, and thoughtful consideration of this appeal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Happy for you. Thank you. Mr. Murphy, you had mentioned that our final item, we don't have any representation from anybody. <coughs> so do you want to yes. go through the motion? Yes. Okay, so let me get back to that. Hang on one second here. So our final item is item D3, case number 190514, public hearing on the appeal of yeah, Michael I mean, Lemansky, petitioner and owner for the following variances. Alternate expanding non-conforming structure. B, wave 2.2 feet of the minimum required south side yard setback of 8 feet located at 1203 North Blair Avenue. Mr. Murphy. Yes, the petitioner did submit to us a request. They're unable to per attend tonight, and they don't have a representative that's able to attend for them tonight. They did ask to have the case postponed, so you can take that into consideration. We did notice it as a public hearing, so we'll go through the case and we'll open the public hearing and see if there's anyone here to speak on it. Obviously, you can we'll practice. Go through, we'll go through it again, <laughs> but I will. Uh, I'll just give you a brief summary of it <laughs> since you, you, uh, your, your anticipation. You can't wait until oh, the next month. So, uh, this this house is located at the corner of Blair and Derby. You can see from the photograph in front of you that the, the house maintains a setback of 5.8 feet from the side lot line adjacent to the sidewalk and the ordinance requires it to have a minimum side yard setback of eight feet the petitioner is looking to do a rear yard addition to the structure and it would be in line keeping that keeping the structure in the addition would be in line with that existing exterior wall so the addition would maintain the non-conforming setback. It would not conform to the eight-foot setback requirement. It would be a continuation um, of that 5.8-foot side yard setback. They need a variance to, to waive, uh, to expand the non-conforming structure in a non-conforming manner and waive that required setback. And with that, if you want to open the public hearing. I will go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to address us on this matter? Not seeing anybody, I will go ahead and close the public hearing. Would you like to have a motion to postpone, to, to postpone till next month? Mr. I'd like to make a motion to postpone this, to adjourn it till next month. Second. Second. Any comments on the motion? Not seeing any, I will call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion carries. Yes. Do we have any other visits for the good of the people? Not at this point in time. Then we are looking for the mystery motion. Motion to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Support. <coughs> right, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>